introduce uh, Andrew Nelson. He comes to us from uh, the Keck School of Medicine at USC, and qu quite a nice transition from our last talk to discuss uh, choroidal metastases. So, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Okay. So, as Dr. Jardine mentioned, I'm Andrew Nelson from coming uh, from USC. I'm going to be talking about diagnosis and management of choroidal metastases. Um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Shakur for helping me select this topic and prepare this presentation. I'll actually end up citing uh, some of Dr. Welsh's work, so hopefully uh, this isn't too redundant, but hopefully we can uh, consolidate some of what we just learned. So I'll be uh, talking about how to differentiate choroidal metastases from other choroidal tumors, and then we'll discuss the epidemiology and the roles of systemic and local, local therapy in managing this disease. So we'll start out with a case. Uh, this is a 62-year-old female with a history of recently diagnosed stage four lung adenocarcinoma, presenting with two weeks of progressively blurry vision in the left eye. She notes that the blurriness is more concentrated temporally and also endorses headache and photophobia for two weeks. Her past medical history is relatively non-contributory. Um, she has a history of myopia in both eyes, status post LASIK in 2003. On examination, visual acuity in the right eye is 2040 minus two, pinholing to 2020 minus two, and the left eye is 2200, pinholing to 2060, and she has an afferent pupillary defect in the left eye. Examination is otherwise unremarkable. Slit lamp examination is unremarkable apart from trace cortical cataracts in both eyes. And on fundus exam, you can see that in the right eye, there are these um, two sort of yellowish, um, pale lesions in the choroid. Um, in the right eye along the temporal, the superior arcade as well as supranasal to the disc. In the left eye, there's this very large um, elevated lesion involving the optic nerve and the fovea with some possible um, sub subretinal fluid guttering inferiorly. So here's the OCT of that left eye. You can see um, elevation of the choroid with compression of the overlying choriocapillaris as well as the presence of subretinal fluid under the fovea and some small pockets of intraretinal fluid as well. On ultrasound on B-scan, um, you can see the lesion here in the posterior pole has sort of a plateau shape. It's about 11 millimeters in width and about 1.5 millimeters in height. And on A-scan, it appears to have a high to moderate internal reflectivity. So the differential diagnosis here for a choroidal amelanotic lesion would be essentially any um, type of choroidal tumor. However, given that this patient um, has a recent diagnosis of lung cancer, choroidal metastasis would be highest on the differential. And then there are, excuse me, there are also some um, imaging findings which can help us differentiate a choroidal metastasis from other uh, choroidal tumors. So the first thing is that in the right eye, we see these two lesions which are potentially also tumors. We learned later that they, that they do also represent tumors. And um, met metastases are, met are can potentially present um, as multifocal or bilateral, whereas other primary choroidal or primary choroidal tumors are generally in the same uh, one location. On OCT, um, the presence of subretinal fluid is the most sensitive and specific finding in choroidal metastases compared to other choroidal tumors. Something um, you might also see in a choroidal metastasis is a lumpy, bumpy appearance. Um, and we don't really see it here, it looks pretty smooth. Um, some other potential findings are hyperreflective dots in the subretinal fluid or shaggy looking photoreceptors, and we don't really see that here either. On B scan, um, the best way to differentiate a choroidal metastasis from a choroidal uh, melanoma is the height to base ratio. So, a, a choroidal metastasis will tend to undergo expansile growth along the choroid, and it'll have a height to base ratio of roughly uh, 0.2. This one here is about 0.15. Um, whereas choroidal melanomas tend to invade anteriorly through an intact Brooks membrane, so they have more of a dome shape, and the height to base ratio is generally around 0.6. And then on A scan, um, choroidal metastases tend to organize into sort of glandular like structures internally, which are echogenic, and so they have more of a moderate to high internal reflectivity. Whereas choroidal melanomas, as we learn, can be hollow in the middle with necrotic areas, and so they generally have a low internal reflectivity. So a few things about epidemiology, um, choroidal or uveal metastasis are the most common overall intraocular tumor in adults. And in postmortem studies, they've actually been shown to be present in anywhere from 4 to 10 percent of patients who died of cancer. Um, the incidence of diagnosis of patients living with cancer is lower at about uh, 2 percent. And so this indicates that our, uh, 
a large uh, proportion of patients are asymptomatic and likely go undiagnosed during their lifetime. As we learned, up to one-third of cases have no known primary cancer at the time of diagnosis. And so in those cases, uh, systemic workup with um, likely a PET CT would be indicated to identify the tissue of origin. And in cases where that's inconclusive, a fine needle aspiration biopsy of the choroidal met metastasis may be indicated. Um, so as we learned, breast cancer is the most common primary tumor of origin. Um, this is the overall incidence. In women, it's as high as 90%. Um, lung cancer is the second most common, and then other types of cancer are generally much less common. But any tumor which has the potential to undergo hematogenous spread can show up in the <coughs> Um as, as far as the ocular sites of metastasis, the choroid is by far the most common site. And this likely has to do with its rich vascularity as well as potentially having a supportive microenvironment for the growth of metastatic cells. So at time of diagnosis with choroidal metastasis, about 70% of patients have blurred vision, and they may have metamorphopsia if the fovea is involved as well. They may also have visual field defects or flashes and floaters if there's an associated retinal detachment. Um, and an ex exudative retinal detachment um, secondary to the accumulation of subretinal fluid would be the most um, common complication of a choroidal metastasis. There's also the potential for local invasion into the optic nerve, as well as Brook, Brooks membrane rupture, which would result in sort of a mushroom-shaped appearance on fundoscopy. But this is much more common in choroidal melanoma than in choroidal metastasis. So any patient with a multimetastatic cancer um, would um, generally require systemic chemotherapy. And choroidal metastasis have actually been shown to regress with systemic therapy alone in about two-thirds of cases. Um, and there are many targeted therapies now, which are uh, very widely used, which uh, target different tumor genotypes. In lung cancer specifically, we see like e EGFR-positive cancer can um, be targeted with these tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, and they're generally used as either adjuvant therapies or maintenance therapies in between regimens of uh, systemic chemotherapy. Local therapy is also used generally in conjunction with systemic therapy because it's been shown to improve response rates and reduce recurrence rates. Um, and then external beam radiation therapy is the most common and um, most uh, uh, best studied method of local therapy. It's been proven to improve uh, visual acuity outcomes in patients with coronal metastasis, um, and it also reduces exudation. However, it generally takes a few months to have full effect. Um, Photodynamic therapy is something that ophthalmologists can do, which um, has a more, it produces a more rapid um, improvement in visual acuity, and it also is very useful when the fovea is involved. Intravitreal anti-VEGF injections um, produce uh, regression of the parotal metastasis, as well as reducing, uh, reducing exudation, and has the lowest incidence of uh, treatment-related complications. So this has a prominent uh, or a promising future as well. Um, however, there are no uh, randomized, control randomized controlled trials um, which compare these different local therapies with each other. And so selection of the appropriate local therapy for a patient really requires careful consideration of their uh, structural involvement, their prognosis, and their quality of life goals. So going back to our case, our patient was found to have an EGFR positive lung cancer with metastases in the liver, bone, brain, and choroid. She received systemic chemotherapy with um, whole brain radiation therapy as well, and uh, received maintenance or lotinib, which is a targeted therapy for uh, EGFR positive lung cancer. This is what she looks like now, which is three years after diagnosis. So those two um, lesions in the right eye, which did turn out to be tumors, have apparently regressed. And then on the left eye, that large lesion is now totally flat and atrophic. This is what her OCT looks like, and there's no more subretinal fluid or intraretinal fluid or choroidal elevation. We just see some residual uh, choroidal uh, compression and hyperreflectivity in that area where the lesion used to be. So very briefly, this is a, uh, another case of a patient with the same disease, EGFR-positive lung cancer, presenting with um, a much worse prognosis and a complete um, retinal detachment in his right eye. You can see the retina positioned all the way anteriorly against the lens here. Unfortunately, this patient did not respond to therapy and ended up passing away um, slightly after this, uh, these were taken. Um, so this just illustrates the point that the response of choroidal metastases to therapy often parallel the response of a patient's systemic disease. 
So here are my references. Thank you very much. Thank you.